You want the old check one, two, three? That's very dramatic, that shot. Especially with this narration from the... Okay. Look at that. Even, even out here with a view like this, we have technical difficulties now and then. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of RBC Avion, welcome to the Inn at Bay Fortune. Welcome to Prince Edward Island. Chef Michael Smith here, and so nice to to have the time tonight to just get together a little bit and share. This, this has been just wonderful the last year or so, sharing details of this farm, coming together, sharing a little bit of honest cooking, family cooking, and just sort of marking time and place, the seasons. And over the last couple of months, we've tried to do a couple of different things. Last month, we had a chance with uh, RBC's, uh, RBC Avion sort of let's go give her style we went to our fire garden and we cooked live fire and we learned a thing or two about building fires and how it all sort of fits together here at the inn of bay fortune this is my world this is me this is live this is the real me i mean i don't even have sleeves tonight there's nothing up them in the first place and and i know for a lot of us we've been together a long time and i know there's tens of thousands of you out there tonight it's just so nice to share and all these years cooking real food and just learning lessons together. It's been wonderful. And so RBC Avion, thank you so much for bringing all of us together tonight on behalf of my team and everybody watching. It's just nice to be here. So welcome. And yes, welcome to the NFA Fortune. This is my world. This is my family's business. My wife and I run and operate the inn. Chaz is uh, the genius behind all the crazy cool design here. And and our hotel and how that all sort of fits together every day. And I look after the, the kitchen and the, and, and the farm is part of our world as well. And that's where we are right now. I'm actually standing on our sky deck at the moment here. We call this the sky deck where I'm standing. And, and from here, I can really see uh, all the major parts of our farm. And we're gonna sort of cover a little bit of that through uh, over the next hour or so. And, so I sort of look out to what we call our upper farm. And in front of you, you can see a series of greenhouses here in the foreground and in the distance, what we call row covers. And there's actually uh, five row covers up there now. And that's a very, very efficient part of our farm to cover the land, to, to grow certain things there under those covers. It's really a unique part of our ecosystem. And we're gonna see more of what comes out of that ecosystem once we get cooking. Right now though, as I look around and I look off in the distance towards where the mushrooms are in the far distance, where we're growing in the woods and our wood piles drying. It's been, it's been very, very dry here over uh, the recent weeks and really most of August uh, and even the tail end of July, it's been pretty dry here. Climate's definitely changing. I think we all know that. And what we're feeling here is just a little more erratic weather pattern, sort of trying to figure it out these days. And last year, for instance, we had epic rain on Prince Edward Island, just epic rain. And this, and always at the right time of day and at night, not too much. It was just a glorious rainy year. And, and that as a result meant lots and lots and lots of mushrooms last year. This year, not so much rain, not so much rain. It's been pretty dry, but a couple of days ago, that big giant sort of massive crazy rain that moved its way across central Canada and on its way to the Maritimes. Well, it hit us and it started raining here. And it, it, it just, it broke is what it felt like. And all that humidity just fell out of the air at long last on this farm of ours. And, and I guess I'm sharing this with you because it's just so unique when, when farming is a part of your life, your perspective on rain really does shift. And and I know that rain these days can be erratic and it can be unfamiliar and it can be extreme and excessive and it can cause real damage. But here now in the moment over the last few days, it was just nice to get rain and to wash all the, the dust away at the very least, just to clean this place up. Just you know, like it's just been so darn dry around here. And so now just a couple of days later, 48 hours or so later is when you really start to see the effect of that rain. So that's what I'm seeing now. And I'm really enjoying it. This is just a really special place to be up here. And as I sort of look off this way, you can see what we call our chef's garden in the distance. We're looking past our farm bar. This time of day, it's closed up. And off in the distance, you can even see our wine house. But really what you see there is the chef's garden and, and everything we grow, there's a little bit of everything down there. And 
it just looks so glorious right now. So many different little ecosystems down there, so many different little types of plants, so many different types of vegetables. And we're gonna take a look at a lot of them as we start cooking this evening. So for now though, um, books, some of the recipes that we've shared tonight, you've got our event guide and no need to cook along exactly with me. If you'd like to make some of these recipes, feel free to just absorb the recipes, get the ingredients, follow the details and cook them at your own pace. But no need to try and race along with me right now. I'll show you the highlights, the, the high points, and we'll delve a little deeper into some of the details that really matter. So we're gonna cover off four different recipes and they come from a variety of books. It's, gosh, it's one of been, been one of the neatest parts about revving up this in eight years ago with Chaz and my family and getting the Anna Bay fortune going. I, I sort of took a few years off from writing cookbooks there. I think it was like seven years I took off and, and now I'm back to writing cookbooks. And I love writing cookbooks, I really do. I'm so honored and fortunate to have writing as a regular part of my life and writing recipes and writing collections and coming together and telling the stories of the, the various things that we've done here at the end has really reignited that sort of passion in me. And the sort of the first book, if you will, is of course, Farm Fire Feast. And, one of the recipes we're gonna to do tonight comes directly out of that book. And that book came out last year and it really does tell the whole story of the Inn at Bay Fortune and everything we do here. Because I stand here in the middle of a culinary farm. This farm exists, every, we grow hundreds and hundreds, literally hundreds of varieties of vegetables, herbs, plants, fruits here for our restaurant. And we grow what we serve here. And, and it's been such a wonderful thing to learn from. And, have had a chance now to write that in the, our books. So the first book, Farm Fire Feast, really told the whole story here of the Inn at Bay Fortune. And now I've had a chance to write another book called Farmhouse Vegetables. That book is gonna be out next year. We're gonna share a little sneak peek of some of the recipes in that book. And here's a little sneak peek, a news flash, it's exciting for me. We've, uh, Penguin and Random House and I have really just come to a recent agreement. I'm gonna do another one. And we're, the next one's gonna be called, gosh, I'm so excited. At long last, after so many years, finally, the universe is gonna let me write a book called Wood, Fire, and Smoke. But it's gonna be 2025 before you see it. Anyway, we're awfully excited. I say we, because there's a lot of us here. You'll see some of us later. There's this crazy guy holding the camera right now, which is why you can see me. Al Douglas is here, great fellow. You'll meet Guy later. Our, all of us get to work on this stuff together and we're really thrilled for that opportunity. It's nice to share. So just updating on life on the farm here on Prince Edward Island, Chef Michael Smith. Let's get cooking as I double check my notes. So here we go. Let's do some, uh, we're gonna start with, uh, gosh, this really is one of my favorites right here. Uh, this simple salad in front of me. This is a simple tomato salad and and now I've said that word simple twice, haven't I? And how many times have you heard chefs say, oh, it's simple, isn't it? And I guess that means one thing when a chef says it and something else when we get home. But I guess when I say simple in this context, what I mean is, is really there's elegance in cooking when we find simple flavor combinations. They don't have to be elaborate. They don't have to be grand. There doesn't have to be 90 different things in the mix to really reach peak excellence, to really find something truly delicious. And one of the sort of joys of farming, one of the joys of being able to share these flavors with you here on this farm, surrounded by all this wonderfulness, is, is really just the things that you see on the farm, being present, you know, sort of sticking around, you know, showing up every day, if you will, and, and just watching and feeling and learning. And here's exactly what I mean. And so in front of me, tomatoes as well, some amazing basil. Now imagine what it must be like. We all know this salad, eh? The amazing tomatoes and the amazing basil. Like we've been there together, haven't we? And I'm sure you've been there yourself too. Just taking all kinds of whatever basil you can get your hands on and then mixing it up with tomatoes, olive oil, salt and pepper, maybe some fancy balsamic vinegar from some trip 20 years ago in the back of the cabinet somewhere or lemon juice or the like. That of course is not this salad though. That's what you might do with amazing tomatoes on the farm during basil season. And I'm looking over there in the distance. I know exactly where the basil is growing. We have no less than seven 
seven different types of basil growing over there right now. I mean, that's what a culinary farm does. We don't just grow basil, we grow all the basil. So we've got lemon lime basil, we've got Genovese basil, we've got this crazy fluffy basil, these giant leaves. Look at those big fluffy leaves, purple basil, cinnamon basil. Um, there's this Thai basil with these sort of little purple flowers, but tonight we're not gonna serve basil with tomatoes. And this is a delicious thing. And I urge you to do this at the first chance you get, go straight to the local farmer's market, do whatever it takes. Make sure this summer that you do eat some really good tomatoes and really good basil, but not tonight. And here's why we're gonna move on here. Instead, we are going to do something with marigolds. And here's why, and this is what I mean. This is something really amazing that I've learned right here on this farm. This is a group of flavors that I really treasure. And I wanna share this with you. And here's what I mean. So first, tomatoes. Folks, we all have access to tomatoes in different ways. Um, this time of year, it's a lot easier to find some really good farm-grown tomatoes, different parts of the country. Tomatoes come into season at different times. Here on Prince Edward Island, honestly, our tomatoes, many of them are in those row houses that I just, that we sort of see there in the distance. That's kind of a little bit of the Mediterranean over there. Um, the first greenhouse, the spreads are a little small, eh? and maybe that's the metaphor for all of them because it's been dry here. It's been dry this summer. So we don't have our own tomatoes yet, just now in this farm. They're just starting to pop in the, one of those row houses over there. You'll just have to take my word for it. But these are not them. We're, these are a great example though, of good heirloom tomatoes that you can find at a local farmer's market, even produce in your own backyard. And a great example of the sort of tomatoes that are gonna be coming out of our greenhouses in the weeks to come. And so once you've sort of taken the time to find those amazing tomatoes, what you might discover, especially if you take the time to grow those tomatoes, is one of the core sort of precepts of farming. The farm around me is dedicated to sustainable, regenerative agriculture. It's what we do. It sounds crazy. It sounds big. It far surpasses, you know, mere organic farming. And it really, it comes down to the basic concept that when we take something out of the earth, we need to put something back. And so being present, farming in a very sustainable way has taught us so many different things. And one of the things that we do, because we don't just sort of throw chemicals and spray things left and right to keep our tomatoes healthy. What we've come to understand is quite simply companion planting. And so if we were to wander over there and take a closer look at our tomato greenhouses, you would discover a very deliberate pattern of tomato plant, marigold plant, tomato plant, marigold plant, and so on and so forth. Every single one of the thousand tomato plants that we have on this property is directly next to a marigold plant. And we do that in our greenhouses because marigolds uniquely are one of the pesticides of farms like ours. They really do discourage various harmful little things that wanna screw around with our tomatoes. They, the marigold right next to the tomato plant keeps that thing away. And I gotta tell you, this is real and it's glorious to watch. It's glorious to see, it's glorious to have these incredibly healthy tomatoes, this diversity in our tomatoes. And we have a trial garden and we've had the opportunity to test a wide variety of tomatoes to discover which ones work best on our farm and all of that with marigolds on side. And so naturally, you know, the day came and you're standing there in the garden with the tomatoes and geez, they're looking good things are happening and there's the marigold right next to it. And these little flowers, of course, are known to be wonderful and edible. They're sort of a little garnish you sometimes see in great cooking, have a delicious sort of flavor. And then you take a closer look at the rest of the plant, these wonderful sort of feathery little fronds that, that they have these marigolds. And, and then you try maybe, I don't know, so you try the leaf, eh? And, you start eating the leaf, you know, just for kicks, eh? And the flowers are nice and there's yellow ones and orange ones and red ones and all these different colors. And they all have leaves, right? 
I mean, it's just the flowers that are pretty, but the leaves. And then you realize, like, you can't stop. These are darn things. Well, they're so tasty. They're just so darn good because they have this sort of citrus flavor to them. And it's very clear. It's very obvious. You know, it's this sort of fresh citrus flavor. Like it tastes like it's sort of somehow related to lemons and limes and oranges, and especially oranges, almost like an exotic orange. So, so then you do like the natural thing, right? So you start just throwing it in with the tomatoes because you know, one of the things that all of us great cooks have learned over time is this things that sort of grow together often go together, you know, and that's the salad. So if you have an opportunity to mix marigolds and in particular marigold leaves, the leaves from the plant, these beautiful feathery little leaves that have this unmistakable, surprisingly delicious citrus flavor do take that chance you know jump right in and see you'll be amazed this is such a glorious flavor combination and we've we've given you the recipe i've given you the recipe for a, a sort of simple shallot vinaigrette classic dressing of sorts <laughs> that uh that texture there i love that texture those shallots are always such a great ingredient you know when we when we make um dressings and the recipe include shallots i mean sometimes you wonder to yourself oh gosh it says shallots like really i mean couldn't i just use an onion or something or they, they're kind of pink the shallot you know maybe i should get like a red onion like really is this worth it and it is is what i'm saying i, I love that about shallots they have a, a particular sharpness that transcends onions and that's why we take the time you often find that sort of subtle sharpness, if you will, that subtle richness, almost umami-like flavors in, in shallots. So that's all this really is. Great all-purpose vinaigrette, nice to have in your fridge. And uh, all I'm gonna do is just pour a little bit in and just dress her up a little bit. There we go. What else do we have here? Now, something else you can sort of mix into all of this is a standard pickled red onion. Take a close look at that. So what you see there, lots of uh, thinly sliced red onions. Look a little closer, you see some spices. You might notice a nice distinctive red color. And, but what you can't see, of course, is the, the obvious, the vinegar and the sugar and the simplicity of it. And this is just such a wonderful all-purpose condiment to have in the mix. So perhaps of all the various things that we might do tonight, this is a great takeaway just to uh, simply make some pickled red onions. Uh, it's very easy to just bring this sort of mixture of sugar and vinegar, a little bit of seasoning to the boil in a small pan, and then just pour it over the, the, the onions and you create this condiment that you can keep easily in your refrigerator and use for things like this. You know, and just adding a little bit of this sort of pickled onion to these tomatoes, to these marigolds and all this color. And of course, don't be afraid, you know, as you use it. And this obviously isn't a recipe. And I know you've heard this from me so many times. This is just about being present. And of course, feel free to use some of that the juice, you know, so much flavor there. And, and of course, feel free to put this away for next time. You know, and that's the beauty of having things like pickled red onions in the mix. You can just sort of hold on to that and just be random. And it's not so much that it's random, it's, it's summer cooking. And I guess that's what I'm trying to share with you tonight is I sort of stand here in the midst of the farm, present, engaged, looking at all these vegetables around me thinking about the essence of August, if you will, because really once this rain has begun and washed everything away and cleaned everything up and the plants are all poppy and I can't resist just looking at them. It's so exciting this time of year. And, and that's what this food is about. And this is what it's about in your world right now, because this is the time, August across Canada, this is the time when all of that persistence, all that patience, all that planning, 
all that thinking all winter long, all that hope, watching plants, watching seeds, watching seedlings, watching them become plants, watching raw fruits start to emerge and become green. And eventually, eventually August comes and it's time. So that's what we want to look at tonight is food like that. Things that you can go find at your local farmer's market, perhaps things that really represent August across Canada. And one of the best, of course, is just tomatoes. We're heading into tomato season. For many of us, it's already begun. We'll have a great run across the country. We're going to have all kinds of great flavors to share. And if you get a chance, do take the time to combine some fresh local tomatoes, as much variety as you can, with marigolds. It's going to be a game changer for you. Marigold tomato salad, the essence of summer cooking. Okay, we're off to a good start. Let's do another one, shall we? Okay, here we go. Don't fall down those stairs behind you, Al. Come on, show the, show the folks at home how dangerous this job is, Al. That's, this, is, this is the big leagues up here. Look at us way up here in the sky. And uh, so that was tomato marigold salad. And uh, now, we're gonna, now we're gonna move on. And oh, this is one of my favorite. This is legendary. This is epic right here. This is something very special that um, happened here at the end last summer. And, I suspect that other chefs may have stumbled onto this sort of flavors in the past. And, and here's what I mean, fennel mustard pickles. Okay, so a lot of simple things here to, to sort of digest. First, the mustard pickles. This is, a, this is a recipe that's going to be in my next cookbook, Farmhouse Vegetables. This fennel is grown here on our farm. This is our fennel. We grew this fennel just up over that way. And we're pretty proud of that. Fennel does take some, some good tending to pull this sort of thing off and to get heads that big. That's something to be proud of in our world. There's lots of flavor there. And we've even learned how to capture all this green flavor here. So much of um, what we usually do with fennel is just sort of combined to the, to, the, to the bulb end, if you will. The roots would be just here. In fact, that's kind of what the roots would look like. Okay, that's what the plant would kind of look like. We've cleaned this up just to show you. And there's actually lots of flavor here. And this, this is the sort of thing that heads for our skunk works. Do all kinds of funky stuff down there. You never know, this might end up turned into some kind of fermented, hydrated, rehydrated, dehydrated dust or something, you never know. But back to the, to the fennel and, and the fronds. This doesn't always play. One thing that we've had such great success with this summer with the fronds is making ice cream. Our pastry team has been making ice cream with the fronds. It's been going really, really well. We do what we call lots of high ratio cooking where we have such extravagant amounts of this that we can really just take insane amounts of it and make ice cream out of it. I mean, who knew? But back to fennel mustard pickles. Mustard pickles, and I'm holding in my hands the very essence of historical maritime cooking. This is this is the condiment of the Maritimes. This is mustard pickles. This is a very big deal in the communities around me and in the foodways and traditions of, of Maritime Canada. Everybody's got a family recipe. These are simple ingredients that, uh, that we use this time of year, cucumbers, bell peppers, lots of spices. And everybody's sort of got their own family way of doing it. And, some of us might actually preserve it to the degree that we can it, pack it the right way, it can sit on a shelf for the winter. And at heart, it is just a way to sort of store, you know, vegetables to take extravagance. And here's the mark, here we go. See if it'll pop. There we go, popping right off. You can see what we're talking about, cucumbers. Sometimes there's even cauliflower in this. But what you see here is actually one of the finest examples in all of Maritime Canada of this wonderful condiment. This is actually a gluten-free version. And this version comes to us from Chef Craig Flynn. Some might say Mr. Nova Scotia, certainly one of the fellows who has um, been just so instrumental in helping define Nova Scotia cooking and regional Canadian cuisine for the world. I'm proud to know Chef Craig Flynn as a friend, colleague. We've cooked together for a long time. And this is actually his recipe at heart for maritime mustard pickles. And so here at the end, this is something that we make a lot. We often use it as a condiment with our fish courses or 
various other things that we might do. It's just a very common part of cooking around us here in the Maritimes. And it's particularly nice to be able to grow the vegetables that go into the actual condiment. At heart, the condiment is the vegetables, but it's also seasoning. So take a closer look. We'll start over here. We, we got mustard, uh, mustard seeds, uh, ground mustard, that sort of sharp mustard profile, very much a part of the condiment sharpness and brightness. Um, turmeric, of course, turmeric adds lots of that bright yellow color that's uh, so, so much part of um, curry. Um, turmeric, of course, great example of why we consume spices at all. Historically, we know this is one of the healthiest foods, one of the healthiest spices we can consume. It's a large part of why we eat it as humans, why it's a part of curry. Curry, of course, is a blend and turmeric's often a big part of it. Um, here we've got some chili flakes, just lots of heat, lots of that nice warming heat. We actually grow our own chilies now at the end and lots of different chilies and produce our own chili flakes. Uh, cumin, very common in this flavor blend. Cumin has a nice calming effect, soothing effect actually on our, on our stomachs, it, it really does. Fenugreek, another very common flavor in the curry mix. So just a very, not, not a, a, a sort of random group of flavors, but a common group of flavors, what we tend to know of often in the curry mix. And so that tends to be, that's why the color is so obvious and prevalent. That's where all that flavor comes from. So in front of me, fennel. Take a closer look, because this is, this is awesome. This is something we started doing last year. We're steering all this beautiful local halibut, our fish course. We've got all this fennel in the garden. We've got all this halibut. We've got all this fennel. We like mustard pickle. Next thing you know, it's mustard pickle and fennel. And this has become one of our single most favorite and amazing ways to serve fish here at the end. We give this a few minutes to just sort of sit and relax for these flavors to come together. And after all these years of eating this signature condiment, this condiment that is in every kitchen around me, in community after community around the Maritimes, this condiment that I reached out to one of the best chefs in the Maritimes to get the gold standard version of, Somehow, this condiment has all of a sudden gotten better. And that's because we grow our own fennel. And just imagine, I want you to try this. Take the time, next time you get your hands on some good mustard pickles, take the time to make your own, shave your fennel as thinly as you possibly can. Nice and thin is the key. And then we simply mix it together. It's amazing to me how something so simple can be so, just so darn delicious, it, you, you know, and over time as a, as a chef, as a cook, boy, I've discovered that lesson just over and over and over again, how the utter simplicity of something is genuinely what makes it amazing, whether it's, you know, tomatoes and marigolds mixed together, or whether it's, uh, you, you know, fennel, crisp fennel, that unique anise flavor mixed in there and all of the spice flavors of the mustard pickles. Simplicity at heart is what makes things unique. So, hey, let's try something new, shall we? Let's roll over this way. We've got a few more recipes to share. I wanna come back to, uh, to uh, that basil that we were looking at earlier. We had that wonderful basil. Um, and this is of course, such a great example of what August is like around here. All these great basils, all these different flavors. And, and this has become, one of our favorite ways here to, to make ratatouille. And so let's take a close look at, at ratatouille, shall we? This is, um, this is a really special recipe. It's a classic uh, Provencal vegetable stew. Um, these are common vegetables that you can find in your supermarket. I wanna show you what this looks like with, with the sort of normal North American bell peppers, eggplant, sort of that classic Italian eggplant, zucchinis, yellow squash. And I'm doing that because honestly, with that lack of rain on Prince Edward Island, we don't have our own version of these vegetables just yet here on this farm. So for, for this tonight, no worries, a good supermarket version. And it still allows me to illustrate the, the essence of what a good ratatouille is. And, and we have to sort of understand that at heart, this is 100% vegetables. 
and we're going to cook these and create a stew of sorts, if you will. And when we sort of dive into cooking vegetables, when cooking vegetables, when adding heat to vegetables becomes the order of the day, and we start approaching something like a stew with prolonged cooking, we're, we're in real danger of damaging the vegetables, of damaging the essence of why we sort of got those vegetables in the first place. And so that's something we want to be very conscious of as cooks. And that's something I respect so much about the craft of making a proper ratatouille. And so if you look at these ingredients and just imagine for a moment, eggplant, onions, peppers, zucchini, squash, tomatoes, and just taking all of these ingredients and just piling them into one pot and bringing it up to a simmer and calling it a stew, just cooking it until everything just sort of came together and everything got soft and edible. That's very damaging. That's not a good way to do it. There's a better way to do it. And that's what I want to show you. And it's in the words in the recipe that you have. And it does begin first with the eggplant. We uniquely take the eggplant out of the mix first and deal with it separately first. And this is often the way that really good ratatouille is made because eggplant is a very different vegetable from all the rest. This vegetable to reach its full flavor potential needs high heat frying of sorts. And so the first step in the recipe is to really take the time to fry the eggplant, to, to use the oil to really reach some high searing temperatures. We even take the time to salt the eggplant, to pull moisture out of the eggplant because there's a sort of unique texture in eggplant that you can reach. There's this beautiful, gorgeous, velvet-like texture that emerges in eggplant. And so it has to be done uniquely by itself, first and off to the side. So that's step one. And then we move on to step two, stewing the vegetables. So let's, let's sort of take a close look at that and check out this gorgeous pan made right here on Prince Edward Island from the finest materials on the planet. Ladies and gentlemen, of course, I'm speaking about one of our famous Meyer pans. And uh, this is our stew a little further down the line, okay? I mean, obviously I'm up here on top of the roof here on the sea cans, our, our farmer's barns, you know, on a couple of picnic tables, there's a little bit of swappery going on here. So let's explain, okay? So this is gonna become ratatouille. Once we add the eggplant, to this. So what is this? Let's take a close look at what this is. And what I want to be clear about here is what you see here is a very logical progression of cooking vegetables. Sometimes we look at recipes and they call for a lot of steps. And the one in front of you for ratatouille says to first do this and then this and then this and then this. So let's explain why. So we come back here first to the onions, the onions and garlic. There it is. And the chili the first step, the flavor base. It takes time. It takes time for onions to brown, to release their moisture, to concentrate. And so we should take that step first, put that step at the beginning, do the things that it takes to reach the flavor base, add the garlic last in that step so we don't burn it. And now we're in a good position to start adding the rest of the classic vegetables. And now what we wanna be sensitive to is texture. So it only makes sense that we're gonna add the vegetables that need the longest time to cook. And that's gonna be the bell peppers. So the bell peppers go in next. And once they've had a few minutes to sort of start to loosen up, start to soften a little bit, then we start to move on to softer vegetables, onto the zucchini, onto the squash. These are soft vegetables. And the secret to the recipe is to cook them just long enough to soften so they don't lose their form. They don't lose their texture. They don't dissolve into some kind of mush. This is respectful cooking. This is old school cooking. This is how you cook when you grow your own vegetables, when you want to take the time to do it right, when you want to show it all off. And here, as you eat this kind of ratatouille, and, and once it's all sort of brought back together, you start to enjoy both the individual and unique flavors, all of these individual vegetables, but there's something else that emerges too. So rather than just eating sort of a stewed version of this, where it's just 
everything's destroyed. Everything tastes the same. It, it all kind of looks the same after you've cooked the heck out of it. Instead, this is more of a salad. This takes on more of a salad-like feel. Everything's still there, but then one plus one somehow equals three. The last vegetable, of course, before I added the ratatouille is obviously the tomatoes. The tomatoes go in last because they're basically just moisture. They're just sort of sitting there ready to just drop all their moisture. Now, along the way, of course, was basil. You can sort of see it here. We call for it in the recipe. This time of year, it's time to add basil to our cooking. And there's sort of two ways to do it. And so we stewed for a while. So I just threw some whole pluches, I like to call those, just threw them right in as that was stewing. And now you have the option to add your fresh basil. So this is where you sort of look around in your community and look for what's available, because this is the time of year where you got to get at least one or two feeds together of fresh basil. OK, we all need that, you know, at least once or twice. So I'm looking at all these different basils that we grow right here on our farm. And you have some options, whatever you can find. These big ruffly leaves, look at that, these big giant ruffly leaves. These are uh, Thai style basil, cinnamon style basil. So really what I'm suggesting is the best thing to do is get lots of fresh basil and then just pick some leaves in. So get the best of both worlds. Cook the basil in first. So you get that unique scent permeated, but then you have the option of adding some more basil. Now, just sort of thinking of this again as a salad of sorts. And when ratatouille is treated this way, when we show this sort of respect for the ingredients, you know, it does take on a salad-like feel to it. And mixing in some fresh basil leaves like this towards the end, it just elevates this to extraordinary. Now, this is what we hope for in the middle of summer. So we've got basil already released, you know, and now we have basil fresh as well. And this is just good, solid Canadian cooking this time of year. Gee whiz, lots to think about, eh? How are we doing here? We have a little glass of water. Looks like we got lots of time, lots to share. Mm. And it smells like basil up here right now. It really does. Like I'm standing up here, the breeze is blowing and I'm still smelling basil. And there's just something about it. I think it's one of the marks as a farmer. You know, I know for farmer Kevin Petrie, who sort of runs our, our farming program here and for all of us that are part of it, basil's a mark for us. There's just something about when your basil starts to finally come along on any farm in Canada, you know, you've sort of hit that exciting, you know, August season, let's go, let's see what's gonna come. And we're there, you know, to be able to cook this kind of way is very exciting this time of year. It even takes us as we segue into our fourth recipe, it even takes us to some really interesting places. So let's swing around and take a closer look at this now. Okay, one of our, one of the sort of core values that we've discovered on our farm, being present here and learning about cooking and learning about farming has just been the notion of life cycle harvesting. Learning that um, produce, that vegetables don't exist, don't just exist sort of frozen in time and place at the supermarket stacked up, but that they also in this environment they have a life cycle. They start as seeds often, sprouts, little cotyledons, they grow and they produce fruit, stems, leaves, and eventually even flowers. And sometimes those flowers become seeds eventually. And, and just different things happen in the life cycle of every plant. And being present, being part of it, allows us to see potential and possibility. And one of the things uh, we can do is in particular celebrate flowers. Flowers are definitely one of the nicest parts about farming and having a culinary farm like ours and having 56 different uh, you know, herb garden beds on our front lawn, 56 different raised beds on our front lawn, each with a unique herb and having an herb house. I can see it right there behind me, this, our herb house where we, Every year we, uh, we um, start our herb season. You can sort of see there. Um, in that environment over there, we can begin our season with herbs. But this time of year, we have all this other diversity and 
and it allows us to get lots of things like edible flowers and it is one of the most fascinating parts about farming so what you see in front of you is just a variety of what today looks like okay this is today um, i'm looking at a variety of things and 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 a variety of different types of flavors um, for instance um, some of these actually have snappy flavor for i'm looking at uh, right here in front of me i'm looking at nasturtiums these are almost arugula like in flavor they have an actual peppery sweet aromatic flavor to them nasturtium flowers um, i'm looking at um, rose scented bergamot oh my goodness one of our most amazing little plants right here the rose scent on that right there, this incredible rose scent right there, one of our favorites. Um, oregano, that just happens to be oregano that's in flower right now. And guess what that oregano flower tastes like? Yeah, yeah, of course, oregano. Um, and then we have flowers like this one, squash blossoms. And this has a, a sort of vegetable-like flavor to it, not unlike the squash, a certain sweetness. And we can do things like, like stuff it. And so we might make a homemade yogurt of sorts, make a lab of sorts and put some black apple, fermented black apple and stuff it in there and do that sort of thing. Um, here's another one of our favorites, fennel flowers. This is um, right off the top of a fennel plant. Those would eventually become fennel seeds. These have a unique, wonderful anise-like flavor, that licorice flavor, so similar to basil that I just can't resist putting them in that little bit. Um, what else do I have in front of me? Here's some anise hyssop, anise hyssop. This has also an, an anise-like flavor, these little purple flowers right here, this sort of wonderful, that characteristic anise flavor, so easy to sort of harvest just like that. Um, these are a, a particular type of um, arugula flower right there. That's what an arugula flower looks like of this particular variety. It happens to have a whitish purple little flower, arugula flowers. Um, other common ones that we use, uh, violas. Violas are wonderful little flowers. Um, not a particularly strong flavor, nothing particularly unique, but just a nice sort of simple sweetness to them. Um, and let's see what else we have. And all of this, oh, here's one of my all-time favorites right here. Check this out. These little delicious little babies right here. These are borage flowers, okay? Those are borage flowers. These uniquely do two things. First, they're one of the best pollinators on our farm. Here's what I mean. Al, peek over the railing. Look down there for a second. Um, what you see are borage plants. All of those plants are there to attract bees. This is a wonderful way to keep pollinators present on our farm. This is a new bed for us. We're establishing it this year. And we're sort of um, planting boards all over the farm because it just does such a great job. The second big thing that, that's so cool about boards, these little flowers, is they taste like cucumbers. And we can even go so far as to freeze them with gin and other little goodies, just like in the recipe. And they're so tasty, cucumber, and making that syrup. So this classic flavor of cucumber and borage and gin, that's what these pops are all about. That's what makes them so unique. So if you want to take the time, make sure you freeze them in advance. And mm, there's just something, and we're not the first to stumble onto this, the uniqueness of cucumber and gin. It's a good simple, basic flavor combination, irresistible. But then we mix in these borage flowers. We mix in these borage flowers because they have this incredible, beautiful cucumber-like flavor. And if you can get your hands on some, grow them for your farm, grow them for your garden, grow them to attract bees, they very quickly establish themselves in beds around your farm, wherever you ask them, and they will attract lots and lots of bees. And then enjoy those flowers, super easy to pick and just delicious. So, hey, this is uh, Chef Michael Smith here, coming to you live from my culinary farm right here on Prince Edward Island at the Inner Bay Fortune, <coughs> forgive me. 
it's been nice uh, sharing four awesome recipes from up here. But now let's do a little bit of Q&A and maybe even a little bit of a fireside chat. So we're going to wander. We're going to head over to the, uh, well, over there to that campfire. See that campfire over there? Let's wander over there, shall we, Al? I'm going to grab my glass of water. Now watch these steps here. Gee whiz. We've been a lot of places together, Al and I. I'm not going to walk backwards down the stairs. You either. This is, uh, this is our farm bar. We're sort of walking past the farm bar here. It's closed up right now, of course. No, hardly anybody around this time of night, but let's roll on over and just sit by the fire for a few moments, shall we? Oh my, what's that? Look at that, waiting for me. Oh, what a treat. Got something special to sip on here. Gee whiz, check this out. Al, you got to try this too. This is our new apple tree lane right here. This is um, our new cider that we're making at the Inn at Bay Fortune. This is named after our uh, wild apple trees. They all grow in a row, so they become known as apple tree lane. There are 26 wild apple trees. And over the last couple of years, they're off in the tree line behind me. We've had a chance to um, sort of clear out those trees and get in the underbrush and get rid of all the dead wood, limb out the trees, clean it right down the ground, get everything out of there, and then start gathering those wild apples. And now making cider with Double Hill Cidery here on Prince Edward Island. This stuff is spectacular. It's just so delicious. Forgive me. Mm. So darn good. Ah, So let's see now. We've got some cookbooks. We've got 10 cookbooks to share. And let's do some Q&A as well and just share a few thoughts. You want to try sitting down, Al? Is that easier? Uh, here we are. Um, so cookbooks, cookbooks, Farm Fire and Feast. We'll be sending this to you folks. Uh, thanks for being a part of this, RBC Avion. Thanks for sharing. So 10 cookbooks. Uh, first one off to Kayoko Tobo. Um, and then we've got one for Lori Clark. We've got one for Ann Lop Lopushinsky. Thank you, Ann Lopushinsky. Susan Davies, uh, Michael Cavillman, uh, Enrico Ferrari, Debbie Miller. Uh, Gita Sridhar, uh, Anthony Vaz, and Molly Schleihoff. Um, hey, cookbooks are on the way. And now, um, as well, let's uh, let's see what we can do for a little bit of Q and A, shall we? So, uh, gosh, lots to think about. So much fun cooking out here like this. I know we've been doing this in our test kitchen uh, for the last year, but nice to get out here tonight too. So. Um, okay, question number one, Roshini, thank you. What made me decide to move to PEI and start a life here? I actually came 30 years ago to be the chef here at the inn. I, I, I like to say I grew up as a chef here. I've actually been chef here twice. So I cooked here for seven years in the 90s. And I, was, I came from New York. I was cooking in the city. I'd been cooking in Europe, doing the whole Michelin star thing. And really just wanted to meet some farmers. You know, I just wanted to plant a garden. Wanted, it was just something in, in me that drove me to wanting to do that thing. I had no idea what that thing was. Oh, of course, I was wet behind the ears. And then opportunity knocked. PEI came out of nowhere, friend of a friend. This country in needed a new chef. And here I am still like 30 plus years later, listening to the squirrels and the trees, the apples. So thanks for asking. Katie Emanuel uh, and, and Paige from Vancouver. Um, what is it like writing a cookbook? What's the process? Well, I mean, I'll summarize it quickly and just say that it takes us uh, about two years or so now. Um, and we like to take our time. We, we, we like to be gracious. We like to think of it as a, as a promise. And so what I said earlier, the title is Wood, Fire and Smoke or the next one. To me, that's a promise to you. And, and so we, we literally start at the top. I do what I call the primary creative and very soon I'll sit down and, and I actually have already done this part done the first part is to like literally think about the title and then think about the table of contents. What are the chapters? If there's 10 recipes, are two of them pork, two chicken, two, four of them beef? And, and then it just sort of becomes, and you stay at that, that sort of table of contents level. And then eventually it becomes about the recipes. And we'll test, if, if the book has 80 recipes in it, we'll test 100. You know, you have a pretty high rate of success. And, and so, 
thinking about wood, fire, and smoke. It'll be about how to build fires and all the various things you can do with fires and how to do it in your own backyard, of course. So I know that's very general. Um, really the best part about it though is just collaborating. And, and, and of course, like so many things in life, when we teach something, we're often, it really takes us to learning about that thing in a fundamentally really interesting way. So it's joyful for me to learn about wood, fire, and smoke and then share it with you. Um, and so on to uh, Chelsea. Um, Mar um, as Chelsea's asking about the marigolds. Thank you. And the what varieties you saw me using? They're all they're all good. Um, all the different colors. Um, just try them. Like literally, when you're at the plant store, there, make sure they're not spraying weird stuff, but try them. Um, you'll find uh, those beautiful feathery little fronds. But basically, any marigold works. Um, Reed asks, is there a favorite part of our farm? where I like to harvest for our recipes. Um, well, yeah, there is, you know, and, and, and it kind of changes, you know, but our chef's garden behind me um, is where we make an effort to plant some of everything. And that sort of keeps us dialed in. And then there's an upper farm beyond, which is far, far bigger. And up there's a lot of permanent beds too. Uh, and those are pretty cool just to, you know, head on up and see some of the big permanent plantings. Uh, so it's hard. I don't know. It's like asking which one of your kids is your favorite. Um, Genevieve asks, since tomatoes are fragile, could they be added at, at the plating off the heat? And I think we're, um, I think we're talking about the ratatouille now. And and if you read the recipe, yeah, tomatoes are definitely fragile. And I do advocate for adding them last and just heating them through just long enough for them to release their moisture to sort of create the saucy business that makes the ratatouille so good. So you could take the time to chop them finely, maybe even puree them or the like, and not cook them at the end of the ratatouille. You absolutely could. I would urge you to try that, especially when we have impeccable ingredients. Um, Jan Janice asks if we would serve the, the ratatouille with brisket or keep it simpler with broccoli and cauliflower. Um, I would serve ratatouille with brisket in a heartbeat. Absolutely. And I, I see you're getting ready to smoke in your big green egg. Um, absolutely. Ratatouille with brisket. I, I, um, I, I wish I was there. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. Go for it. Um, um, quick Meyer pan question for Jennifer. Um, try not to use a metal spoon on, the, on a metal pan, or, but it's okay um, on nonstick pans. Nonstick pans today, of course, are much stronger than they used to be. We've moved on from Teflon. But of course, you're not going to take metal implements and drive them into the pan. Be silly about it. You know, do do uh, do try and be as gentle as you can with your tools when using nonstick. Um, moving on, uh, uh, Thompson uh, planted yellow squash for the first time this year. Um, got your blossoms. Haven't seen the squash yet. Is there something you may be doing? Um, the first thing that occurs to me is I hope they got pollinated. Hope there were bees around. Uh, if they're not getting cross-pollinated, you're not going to get squash. The other thing that occurs to me is uh, maybe just patience. Hopefully, uh, once you get that those those flowers, eventually the fruit starts to form below the flowers. So with any luck, in the next five or so days, you might get those squash. Um, uh, Genevieve asks, I, I did say fermented black apples. Can those be store-bought? I don't know a store that sells fermented black apples. I don't know if it's legal to sell fermented black apples. We uh, ferment our own. We stuff a heated cabinet with them for months and then, uh, you know, haul out these shriveled little gems like these, one of the most amazing and gorgeous little flavor things we've ever stumbled onto. But boy, I digress. We'll have to de dedicate a whole night to fermentation and how black apples can be amazing. Um, in that, and Jennifer, thanks for asking. The gin popsicle is in the next cookbook. It's in Farmhouse Vegetables. Um, it's, it's super cool flavors. Um, Paige from Vancouver is wondering if there's a, a recommend a replacement for the gin um, because you're wisely, uh, as a kid, not drinking gin yet, Paige. Thank you for asking. I would suggest just some orange juice, maybe, um, some apple juice. Let's think about that for a second. Some, uh, maybe some ginger ale. You could pour some ginger ale in. The cucumber is still very much going to be the lead flavor there. And, you know, so much of this popsicle is about the cucumber and the gin. So maybe look for another really cool popsicle to make stuff. Lots of raspberries in too. That would be cool. Um, Theodora asks, when did I add the garlic for the ratatouille? It was added with the onions. 
um, this is one of those recipes where we really take the time to first brown the onions, cook the onions. And once we've given lots of time to the onions, patience for the onions, then we add the garlic, just release the flavors of the garlic uh, towards the end. And um, uh, Thompson, what do we do with all our herbs at the end of the season? We don't um, really freeze or dry a lot of them. We do a little bit of this and that. We make salts and syrups and infuse things. And, and so we save herbs that way, but we don't really make a huge effort to save them because at the beginning of next year, we close for the winter. And at the beginning of next year, we have our herb house and we will have lots of fresh herbs in the spring. And our and Cassidy asks, um, my favorite flavor combinations overall. Um, and and you, you mentioned it yourself, tomato and marigold. And, and I guess tonight I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that. I really like um, squirrel and apples. I, I can hear one behind me jumping around. Um, but tomatoes and marigolds, it really represents um, a true discovery, you know, and that that's such a rare and wonderful thing in life to to stumble on the new things. And I know I can't be the first person to figure out that tomatoes and marigolds taste amazing together. Um, but it is something I discovered for myself and our team discovered this here on this farm. And they taste amazing together and they grow together and they support each other in this environment. And then they taste amazing together in the bowl. So all of that kind of adds up to something super, super special. And so tonight as we, as we sit here and uh, spend a few minutes together and um, I, I'm looking up into the sky, I'll show everybody where that, that sky deck is up there. That's where we were cooking. And that's Chef Guy Tran up there. Guy, come on over and wait for us. There's Chef Guy Tran. He's uh, our food stylist guy, food media producer. Guy's a good buddy of mine. He actually won Chop Canada. That's how we met. We, we've known each other since the day one Chop Canada. And there's Jennifer over there taking care of your van and the back of Al's van there where all the, the GAC is, we call it, the gear. And, uh, and this is the team. And, and, I'm, and somehow I, I, I can't show you Al because he's like bound up in the camera. Actually, there he is. Yeah, well done, Al. But it's, it's still like tied to him. Uh, so thanks for, thanks for spending time with us tonight. I do want to end though with some quick thoughts. I want to I just ask you to think about something until we have a, a chance to do this again. And we will have a chance to do this again soon. Um, we're in a time of transition. So many of us love our, our experiences in restaurants. And I know I do. I love both sides of restaurants. I love being part of the back of the house and cooking and being a chef and being a part of a team and serving something wonderful. But I also like going to restaurants and going with Chaz and going with my kids and and just enjoying when somebody else cooks. And I know you do as well. And, and I know you can sense and feel, and many of us have experienced this time of transition that our industry is in. And I'm asking for your patience. I really am. I'm asking you to be gracious. I'm asking you to look around your community and take the time to figure out which restaurants are really treating their folks the best and, and taking good care of their team because we really are in this colossal time of transition for our industry. We've, we're struggling to fully staff our kitchens and, and our dining rooms and our teams in a fundamental way that we've never dealt with, certainly in any of our lifetime. It's very real and it's very profound and you're hearing about it in the news. And I'm saying to you that it's very real and I'm asking you to look deeply into your own communities and look for ways to support restaurants that, that, that sort of deserve your support and look for restaurants that are part of a new culture moving forward. Because the gut-wrenching truth here is that we are in a time of transition. And it is gonna take bold action on the part of a lot of restaurants. And it's gonna take our understanding and compassion as consumers. Our prices need to rise. You're hearing stories about record sales in our industry and that's fine, but we also have record prices for the inputs, the things that we have to buy, the lights and the, the food and the things that we need to buy to take care of you in our restaurant. So this is not a time of record profitability. This is a time of record failure. This is a time of transition. And that's why I'm just taking the time to say this. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not calling anyone out. I'm not throwing shade. I'm just asking for patience and tolerance. And I'm just asking you to be gracious when you do find the time to come into our restaurants and, and come into places with, with young teams in particular that are just working so hard and just see the humans, see the people, see and respect who they are and, and please be respectful. And, and let's just um, 
understand that fundamentally it's it's going to take a few years and we're going to see prices rise we we as an industry have chased one metric for a very long time we've all been complicit we've all been part of this uh, the food system for the last 20 30 40 50 years has really been focused so much on price and so much of that is now coming due and we're going to have to figure out a way for restaurateurs are going to need a chance to fairly price their products they need a chance to fairly figure out what is a fair price for their efforts they need to make a fair living and they need a chance to figure out how to fairly pass that on to their teams and their staffs and you need a chance as a consumer to figure out how to fairly judge which places are doing the best job of that and all of that is going to take patience so let's just think about that next time we head out and thanks for taking the time to listen to me take the time to say it so hey nothing too serious i just want to say you know once again on behalf of uh, my team here at the nfa forge and everybody around me and this wonderful place prince edward island you know it's so nice that rbc avion has brought us all together and that we have a chance to share and i look forward to so much more we're Geez, we're going to be heading up and shucking oysters for TIFF. We're going to be in the in the lobby with all the film stars running by shucking oysters for RBC Visa too. So just you know, so much fun to have this this time together. Thanks for joining me tonight on Prince Edward Island, ladies and gentlemen, and see you soon. Cheers. <laughs>